Welcome back. You're listening to the panel discussion, The Business of Cloud, sponsored by Vion Corporation and Hitachi Data Systems Federal on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. I'm your host, Jason Miller. Our guests today are Mark Schwartz, the Chief Information Officer of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services in the Homeland Security Department, Todd Simpson, the Chief Information Officer of the Food and Drug Administration in the Department of Health and Human Services, Marlon Andrews, the Deputy Chief Information Officer of the National Archives and Records Administration, and Rob Davies, the Executive Vice President of Operations for Vion Corporation. Now, gentlemen, before break, we we're talking about kind of strategy to the cloud. Let's talk about acquisition. Todd, you, you surprised me to say acquisition is not the big challenge. It's more about security. But I'm going to start with Marlon on this one and, and put him on the spot instead. Marlon, give me a sense from an acquisition standpoint, how is NARA dealing with that acquisition of cloud services? Because it's different. So we just signed an enterprise cloud agreement. And what we're trying to do is organize and standardize on one cloud platform or minimum cloud platforms where possible when we're doing infrastructure as a service or platform as a service. The greatest challenge is not getting a contract in place, but what you find out is where those lines of, where those boundaries cross of who's now responsible because you're in a different infrastructure setup and what the cloud provider is going to do versus the contract staff versus the application support staff versus the infrastructure staff. So that's the greatest challenge we're having now is defining roles and responsibilities and who's going to do what because the world has changed as we've known it and we've been client server for so many years that this is truly a different environment for us. So those are where our challenges, not not so much writing a contract, but once the contract's in place, how do we move forward in a support model that satisfies the requirement? So is that laid out in like service level agreements? Is that laid out in the contract itself? Or is that? It is. It, it, it is laid out in service level agreements, but then when something goes wrong or you need something done, th that's when the finger pointing takes place. And we had a meeting this week that it was... <laughs> Yeah, I, less I don't than, want to less than uh, uh, enjoyable for everybody. Involved. Yes, because we were we were discussing what does the word manage mean <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a cloud environment. So, so it's, it's who has that ownership. So it's just because it's new, we have not worked that out yet, and I'm sure that we're not unique in that situation. So we'll just assume it wasn't with Rob or Vion, but we'll just say, Rob, what does the word manage mean, right? I mean, how how do you deal with issues like that? Because that is a big part of the acquisition. Well, I mean, Marlon's absolutely right. I think you have to specify those in your contract at the outset, and and if you're fortunate, you you get to most of them, or you, you know you identify them. But the 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 devil is in those details. And I think when you're in that negotiating the contract and those SLAs, it's important to define uh, what your expectations are on both, for both parties. Um, and, you know, you might have a statement of objective and this is what I want to accomplish. These are the outcomes I'd like to see. But you really have to work your way through those SLAs. And it is important to have well-defined lines of demarcation. So if you've got a, an on-premise solution and you've brought infrastructure as a service in, well, if that's the asset of the vendor, then the vendor's responsibility is to, you know, this point, right? They care for it, it's theirs. Um, how, and what's what, what are the use provisions of the, the agency at that point? How much, um, you know, how much are they allowed to get into the machine and, and where does manage come in? You, you know, we, you can work to establish, I think, fairly distinct lines. Um, and, and it's just having the experience to do that and having a, a partner that's going to work with you through those difficulties because it, in all likelihood, as to which you alluded, it's going to require modifications as you discover, oh, this is really works for us now. So we do need to make those modifications as we move through the process because both parties learn at that point. Mark, you're shaking your head. Give me a sense of how you yeah. define I, those things. I love the word modifications <laughs> coming in there because uh, what I really wanted to say is that this is about agility. It's about flexibility. And we do so much in our contracting that inhibits our flexibility. Uh, and that, that sacrifices the main benefit of moving to this cloud environment. What we want is the ability to change as we go. So, uh, for example, in the hardware world that we were in before, we had to buy the heaviest duty servers that we thought we might possibly need in the future, right? We had to spend extra to have lots of capacity because if we suddenly needed it, it would take so long to get it. With the cloud, we don't need to do that. We can start with small capacity while fewer, uh, there's less traffic on our websites and then scale up as traffic increases. 
And that way we can spend less because we don't have to pay for the, the extra capacity. So right? let me jump in just real quick just to put a little finer point on that. Uh, I know from when we've spoken before, this is a busy time for USCIS in terms of H-1B visas, if I got that right. Um, if, if you saw a big influx of, of those applications coming in in March or, or April, whenever the deadline is, are you able to say, let's turn that up from two to five to 10 servers? Like, get, give me, can you give me maybe a, a, a real life example? We are absolutely able to do what you just said, and we can do it in seconds. So, uh, you know, this, this gets rid of this problem of uh, servers crashing or slowing down too much when, when the load increases. In fact, we can set things up in the public cloud so that it automatically scales for us. We can say once the load reaches a certain point, add more servers automatically. So, and, and how do you pay for that, though? Because that, right, that's the question. Yeah, because the pay by the drink model, like electricity, we all know we plug in more things in your house, you pay more money. I mean, <laughs> that's that's right. It it really is a utility model, and some of the directions that the cloud is going are going to make it even more so. There there is now this concept of serverless computing, <laughs> uh, which is going to be a big thing, I think, in the next few years, where you, you don't even pay for servers; you just pay for the moments of computing that you actually need. Um, so we have to have a way to pay for it that lets us take advantage of the fact that we don't have to spend so much money. It's easy to, to um, budget for and pay for the maximum you might ever possibly need to use, but why? We can, we can save money by not doing that as long as we have the flexibility. We can think in terms of a maximum. I mean, uh, what we have to not do, let's say, is... Uh, if, if this was your electrical utility, you could say, well, we might turn our air conditioning on all the time, so we'd bet, better make sure we can pay for the electricity for the air conditioning to be on all the time. So we'll pay that amount, we'll pay the maximum air conditioning, and then we'll make sure we keep the air conditioning on all the, all the time. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense, right? Because the electricity company doesn't give us money back if we overpay. I mean, that, that, that'd be nice. We don't want to set this up so that we're overpaying <laughs> exactly. or paying a fixed amount, right? That doesn't give us the benefits. Todd, you're, you're shaking your head a little bit there. I mean, you're just kind of walking into the place where maybe uh, Mark has been for a while. How is your contracting? How's your SLAs? How are you setting up so you don't have a, 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 an uncomfortable dis uh, discussion about management? So, so the SLAs and the shift in the business model has been the challenge. I mentioned the management tools that we put in place at the FDA to allow our customers to get in and out of the cloud environment. We've also set up management tools similarly to what Mark had mentioned to automate our ability to spin up environments. What used to take us weeks, months, even longer, now literally takes us minutes and we can spin up dozens of environments uh, with these automation tools, I think it was it, it's learning how to master that area of the business and getting the um, the right skill sets in that are now capable of managing contracts and managing service level agreements instead of managing servers instead of managing data resources. So that's the big shift. And you know, as we as we perfect this consumption based model, it's for me, it's not really acquisitions at the BPA level. I think the department has done a good job helping us there. I think that our um, grants and our acquisition shop at FDA is top notch and they've uh, helped us along the way facilitate through the contracting. I think that the um, the real challenge comes um, comes in the, the shift in the business model. And, and Rob, talk about the shift in the business model. As clients come to you and say, "Hey, we want to do what Mark or Todd or Marlon described as pay by the drink." How do you set that up? What, what are some of the things that they need to maybe consider, or, or what are you sure. telling your clients? Well, I think he he, he really hit, hit a point we emphasize a lot, and that's with it, it is a technology acquisition. Clouds another technology, you know, and you consume it and use it and that's great but you um you've got to make sure your organization's in step to be able to help you use it and maximize its efficiency so you can extract the value from that new platform so we we touched on it earlier and that's i've got the you know the the legacy silos if you will of administrators system administrators network administrators database administrators and so on and so forth well how do i how do i turn these people who know my environment and infrastructure well uh into into resources now that can help me identify which type of cloud works best for me or works best for my customers. As, as Todd mentioned, I've got customers that I need to to uh, to support, uh, businesses that need to be run, 
and you know they need to come to me for advice on on which cloud platform is best and most economical or or you know most secure whatever the leading requirement is and i think that's a that's a key issue for organizations as they move into that cloud world they they get comfortable with it they understand how to uh, how to acquire it and they start to understand how to manage it and then you really have to optimize it that yeah, I just wanted to add one thing. I agree with everything you said, Rob. By the way, I don't mean to be so agreeable, but it's uh, <laughs> agreeable's good. Don't yeah. worry. So I think that one of the reasons why um, I'm positioned to be successful at the FDA from um, from a shifting business model perspective is because of some of the groundwork that's been done there that I haven't seen in some of the other agencies I've worked, and it specifically comes down to that chargeback model. So. The fact that the FDA has a chargeback model and uh, and a plan to, to enhance that model, that consumption-based model for all of its services coming out of the administrative wing, really positions the FDA, I think, to do that pay-as-you-go. If we didn't have that already in place, we would be we would be several years behind, I think, where we would have to identify all the cost drivers, not just for the cloud services, but for all of our services. Fortunately, uh, we we got ahead of this a couple of years ago prior to me coming on board, and we started moving to that service-oriented mode of operation, and I think that really positions us for for the future. Marlon, one of the things that I seem to be hearing is is the contracting piece is there is a shift going on in terms of how people are thinking about it. When you guys are set up your contract, as you said, you you moved to email. Was, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the easy places to go for an initial. How did you deal with that issue of okay, well, today we need ten thousand email addresses, but tomorrow we may need eleven thousand. How did you deal with that the influx? Um, so, if, if I can back up, have, have have the first disagreement sure. of, of the panel. I, I think resource management is very important as well as the contract management because now we're going to be spinning up a lot of new environments when it comes to test and development. And if you're not careful and people don't take those things back, you're still paying for those. So who whose responsibility is that to track? And I know it's supposed to be the people who spin up the environments, but you have to have that um, verification and pro process in place and that check in place to make sure that you are doing resource management as well. And as well as resource management, you still have to do your patch management and your configuration management to make sure like when those environments come up, they come up secure and in a steady state along with the rest of the environment. But to go back to your contracting question, it, it, it's a lessons learned. You, you try to get better each day as you move forward to make sure that you don't repeat your mistakes or that you talk to other agencies. I, I try to reach out to because I think we're all in the same situation. We have our unique missions. But I think we all have the same challenges, and I think forums such as this and discussions that we have on cloud really helps the different agencies do a better job in, in their contract management moving forward. So at NARA, whose responsibility is it to make sure the verification, the resource management, is it the CIO? Is it, is it a, It's a, ultimately the CIO because it falls under her purview. But we make sure the responsibility of the system owners and that we um, keep them liable for making sure that they do those checks and balances that they're supposed to do. Do they appreciate that? Um, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> their budgets end up appreciating yeah. them. Because, right, because if they end up spending more than they have, that's a whole different discussion. Yeah. But at the same time, they also maybe would, fi quote, unquote, find money because they spun something down and, and moved on. I mean, is that, is that the, the, really the end goal here is, is better control the, the money. The, the end goal is to, is to maximize efficiencies, and, and that's what we're trying to do, and that's why I, I always repeat that mantra, we're all partners, we're all in this together, and so one department's money is not solely their money. It, it, it's all of NARA's money, and it's the government's money. Marlon uh, touched on uh, an issue, and I got, was in a, a, another panel discussion and someone asked the question about uh, who, you know, who, who's ready to go to the cloud, who's, who's you know, what makes an agency uh, cloud ready, if you will? And I said, you know, every agency is ready right now, and, and they, it's it's about stepping into that process and looking to other agencies that have done it before and how they've done it. But every every customer can take advantage of that consumption model to help uh, add flexibility, as as Mark alluded to. Maybe it is a cost thing initially, and and there certainly are economies of scale. Uh, you know, email. I mean, that's a that's an easy 
move and, and it's, a, it's a difficult first step sometimes, but that's where you can get some good economies of scale and cost savings. So uh, I you know, just want to make that point that every, every agency and every organization indeed can take advantage of the cloud. I mean, we do. So it's 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 something you just have to start doing. And I think it's it's getting comfortable with those different things that we've talked about a little bit here, with the, whether it's acquisition or uh, the idea of okay, mission versus back office, as is, is, is I think Marlon talked about. And then we'll talk about security in the next segment. But let, let me just turn to Mark real quick. If Marlon brings up a really interesting point: the resource management piece is that your responsibility? Do you do you share it with the mission owner? Do you have some kind of committee that does it? Uh, I view it as my responsibility, but I think a lot of it can be addressed through automation. And I think that's part of the trick in working with the cloud. So for example, if, it, if it's easy for us to stand up virtual machines in the cloud, it's, it's easy to stand up servers, it's also easy to kill them off. And we can create policies that say if, if this virtual machine hasn't been used in a certain amount of time, kill it. And if it's easy to stand it back up again, nobody's going to notice the difference anyway. So we can we can automate policies. We can uh, we can set reminders. You know, you get an email one morning saying, "You jerk! You know, you've had this <laughs> virtual machine. You spun up. It's costing us money, and you're not using it." Uh, and then just our regular development and deployment process involves constantly killing off our environments and standing them back up again. So we're we're generally pretty sure that we're standing up exactly what we need, and that things are dying off when we need them to die off. And what's the check and balance again? Is it just you go back and see? You have to look at what what servers are up, what servers are down. I mean, do you, do you get a month, a weekly report, or daily report? Do you have a dashboard? I don't actually. Well, no dashboard. Uh, <laughs> Personally, <laughs> everyone has a dashboard. Uh, but we do we do know how much we're spending, and we can we can track that pretty much real time. I think it it comes back um, if we think about it like a utility, like electricity. Right? You know you can save money by turning off the lights in the rooms that you're not using. For a while, we didn't worry about it so much. Now, now that we're focusing more on, on staying green, we try to set up ways that the lights turn themselves off automatically. We try to build awareness. you got to turn the lights off. I, I think it's the same kind of thing when you're dealing with something that's a fairly inexpensive utility on the whole. That one, that one server doesn't cost you that much. Maybe it could work for my kids to turn off the lights. <laughs> Let's take a quick break. You're listening to the panel discussion, The Business of Cloud, sponsored by Vion Corporation and Hitachi Data Systems Federal on federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. <laughs> 